welcome to my YouTube channel. Today guys, we are officially on week two, day four of the Seamless Study Guide. This book that we have been going through in previous videos. Um, and as I've always said, make sure you go and watch those ones back first because it is a series that we are going through to understand God's one seamless love story. And we are basically being taken by Angie Smith, the author, through um, the Bible. And she's going to be jumping to important scriptures and important books in the Bible to help us just understand it as one seamless story. But yeah, let's get right into it. So Angie starts off by saying, I so wish I could be sitting with you right this minute, chatting over what we've covered so far. If I were, I would make sure to get your attention and I'd probably have tears in my eyes at this point. I know that sounds silly, but it's the truth that all of these stories, they aren't just black words on a white paper. And I realised that as well when I read this amazing book. So she says, they're backbone of the faith that we can now claim as our own. These are real people God hand selected to be a part of the lineage that will lead to the Messiah, Jesus. We've just learned about the wrestling match between Jacob and God and the spectacular moment when he received a new name. It's a name with significance to say the least, Israel. But Israel still has to face his brother and he has no reason to believe this meeting will go well. Read Genesis chapter 33 verse 1 to 4. How does Esau respond to seeing Jacob? Hope you guys have got your Bibles with you today. So verse 1. Jacob looked up and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel and the two female servants. He put the female servants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him, and he threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Wow, that's so emotional. So Angie goes on to say, crisis averted, because Jacob fully thought Esau was going to like kill him or something. So Angie says, crisis averted, because Jacob fully thought Esau was going to like kill him or something, but obviously he didn't. So she asks, where does God tell Jacob to take his family? In Genesis chapter 35, verse 1. So, then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there, and build an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So then Angie says, let's take ownership of our knowledge here. And repeat after me, we are not afraid of the maps. Mark the route Jacob took on the map on page 53. And then she says, they started in Haran, also called Paddan Aram, in Laban's territory, which is on the map. Then they fled and headed towards Canaan, which is in Genesis chapter 31, 18. Then they, then number three, she's, she put like pointers here, by the way, one, two, three, four, and five. Then number three, Jacob wrestled with God in Peniel, Peniel if I said that correct, in Genesis chapter 32, 32 verse 30. Then number four, they got safely to Shechem in Genesis chapter 33 verse 18. Then number five, she says God told them to go to Bethel, which is in Genesis chapter 35 verse 1, which is where Jacob had first received God's promise in the form of a vision which is in Genesis chapter 28, verse 19. Okay, back to Jacob and the crew. They're obeying God and heading from Bethel to Ephrath, later known as Bethlehem. These people move more than anyone I know when something dramatic happens. Read Genesis chapter 35, verse 16 to 20, and record the two major events that happen simultaneously. I hope I said that correct, simultaneously. Verse 16, then they moved on from Bethel, while there was still some distance from Ephrath. Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And she was having great difficulty in childbirth. The midwife said to her, don't despair, for you have another son. And as she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Ben-Oni, but his father named him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar, and to this day, that pillar marks Rachel's tomb. So Angie says, let's take a teeny break for a minute. I wonder if you're doing this work, reading the verses, and still wondering when this is going to get somewhere. 
Because as far as you can see, there are just names of people that don't mean a lick to you. Maybe not, but in that event that you do feel that way, I want to have a chit chat before we move on. Every one of these names is important and will shape your understanding of the entire scope of scripture. Not just that, but your understanding of Christianity today. I know it sounds like a big claim, but it's true. One day, a few weeks from now, you're going to be reading passages in the New Testament and a huge smile is going to spread across your face because they finally make sense in context. Pinky promise. So stay tuned and do your work. It will be worth it. Now back to business. Hopefully, that pep talk geared you up for your last exercise of the day. Because it's a big one, you're going to fill out the names of all Jacob's now called Israel sons. Are you ready? So she says, read Genesis chapter 35, verse 23 to 26, and fill this in. So you guys can go and do this. I'm not going to bore you and do this over the video, but you guys can go and read it. So she wants you to list Leah's sons, which there is six. She then wants you to list Rachel's sons, there's two. She then wants you to list Bilal's sons, which is Rachel's maidservant, and there's two. She then wants you to list Zilpha's sons, which is Leah's maidservant, and there's two. So she says, that's a total of 12, and these 12 are considered the 12 tribes of Israel. Kind of, and I'll explain that in a minute. Why? because they are the 12 children of the man named Israel. Forgive me if that's obvious, but it wasn't always the case for me. I know it wasn't the case for me. <laughs> Don't know if it is for you guys <laughs> watching. Now stick with me for a second, because this is going to get a little tricky. Each of these fellas is going to father a tribe that will in turn get a plot of land, but the breakdown looks a bit different from the list above, and I want you to understand why. Levi's tribes will be the priests, and they aren't going to get the land, because the Lord himself is considered their land. So that means only 11 get a land. But wait, there's more. Remember Joseph, who was Jacob's favorite? He's not going to get land either, but it's not because he isn't special. It's because he was so special that each of his sons, Menachah, Menahaseh and Ephraim will get their own land. So in a sense, he doubled up. When we take away Levi and Joseph from the mix, but add Menahaseh and Ephraim, we get back to our total of 12. The lists vary a little depending on which book of the Bible you're reading, but they always work out to be 12. It's not urgently important that you understand the details of the breakdown. But when you see what looks like a discrepancy from one book to another, Deuteronomy, Genesis, this is the reason for the difference. Good? Good. Next up, the golden boy Joseph. And that is in day five, guys, because we are officially done with day four now. So thanks again for watching, guys. I hope you've enjoyed this video. And I hope you enjoyed just simply me reading to you and helping you understand, like I understood, the Bible, the stories of the Bible, God's love story through the Bible. But yeah, guys, I hope you enjoy. Make sure you stay tuned for the next videos. But yeah, make sure you like, comment and subscribe. But yeah, bye guys. <laughs>